those people who are truly independent scientists know that tritium is a very dangerous radionuclide and we should be far more concerned about it than, than the nuclear industry concerned. Hi, you're listening to the Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast, hosted by the Fairwinds crew. I'm Maggie Gunderson, and welcome to the show. You've probably heard of tritium, the radioactive isotope and byproduct of nuclear power generation. As it continues to make headlines with notable leaks at 75% of all reactors in the United States, including Indian Point in New York and Turkey Point in Florida. Tritium is also an enormous problem at Fukushima Daiichi due to the huge quantities of water used to cool the reactors during meltdown. Today, the Fairwinds crew will be joined by renowned British scientist Dr. Ian Fairley to discuss tritium and its impact on the environment and human health. Dr. Fairley is an independent consultant on radioactivity in the environment. He has a degree in radiation biology from Barts Hospital in London and completed his doctoral studies at Imperial College in London and at Princeton University concerning the radiological hazards of nuclear fuel reprocessing. Dr. Fairley was formerly with the United Kingdom's Department for Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs, specializing in radiation risk from atomic reactors. From 2000 to 2004, he was head of the Secretariat to the UK government's Siri Committee, examining radiation risks of eternal emitters. Since retiring from government service, he has acted as a consultant to the European Parliament, local and regional governments, environmental NGOs, and private individuals. Dr. Ian Fairley, welcome to the show. It's my pleasure. I'm joined today by Arnie Gunderson, our chief engineer at Fairwinds, and our program administrator, Caroline Phillips. Ian, we've asked you to come on and join us because tritium has suddenly become a big issue in the United States, both with plants that are being decommissioned and have tritium leaks and spills that have to be cleaned up, and also because of the recent leaks discovered at Indian Point nuclear facility and in Biscayne Bay near Turkey Point in Florida. On top of that, TEPCO is planning to dump millions of gallons of tritiated water into the Pacific Ocean. Can you please talk to us about the issue of tritium? Yeah, sure. Tritium is the radioactive isotope of hydrogen. It is emitted from or created during all nuclear fissions. It is ubiquitous near nuclear power stations. It's either emitted into the air or dumped into the ground or discharged into water courses. The thing about tritium is it's a major headache for nuclear companies. It's created, for example, during nuclear fusion, nuclear fission. Um, it's not only is it a, an activation product, but it's um, a fission product as well. So whenever you talk, about, think about nuclear power, you should always think about tritium. It's um, an inevitable byproduct of, uh, of, um, of, of nuclear reactors. And can you repeat again, the issue with tritium, if I understand it correctly, is that it has hydrogen properties. So that means that it would bind with oxygen, H2O is water. Can you just sort of reiterate that yes. relationship? Yeah, sure. Uh, the most common form of tritium is tritiated water either in liquid form or in vapor form. Everybody knows that water is H2O. Well, tritiated water, one of those H's, or sometimes both, is radioactive. You have effectively radioactive water. Now, in my view, we should be more worried about this because we are all consist of water. Two thirds of the atoms in our body uh, or I should say molecules in our body, um, are water molecules. So that if we are suddenly are exposed to radioactive water, 
it's a danger to us. Health authorities throughout the world should recognize that radioactive water is more hazardous than we think. Water, you said it, it composes up to, did you say 80% of... No, two-thirds. Two-thirds, sorry. Of yes. us, yes. Two-thirds of us. And water is, of course, also evaporated into our air. It's also part of our condensation with fog and rain, etc. So if we have tritiated water, of course, tritiated air, I imagine, is also an issue, correct? Oh, absolutely. And uh, the relationship between tritiated air and nuclear power, I, I think that's less discussed. We've, he we've heard a lot recently in the news about tritiated water found in groundwater, tritiated water, Fukushima and the Pacific Ocean, tritiated water in the Biscayne Bay. What about the tritiated air elements? Well, water vapor is ubiquitous. It's in the air all the time. Indeed, when it's raining, there's a huge amount of water vapor in the air, 100%. <laughs> Although we can't see it, hear it, or feel it, nevertheless, water vapor is very important. This is one of the big cover-ups in the nuclear industry because a nuclear plant routinely gives off about 5,000 gallons a day of water oh. vapor up the stack. That's from leaks inside the plant and evaporation from the fuel pool. Mm. So they're evaporating off as, as air, as gases into air, 5,000 gallons of tritiated water a day. There's a case at, uh, at Indian Point where puddles on site were found to be highly tritiated. And the term is called rain out. When a nuclear plant drops tritium on itself or on the surrounding community, and nobody ever looks for the stuff. Yes, that's very true. Well, the reason why is because one of the characteristics of tritium is it's very difficult to pick up. To be able to monitor it, or measure it, you really need to do, take a swab and transport the swab to a, a wet laboratory and carry out liquid scintillation techniques, which takes about 24 hours to measure. So it's very difficult to get a handle on tritium. It's true that there are some portable electronic devices, but they are extremely expensive. Indeed, I don't know of anyone, either in the United States or in Europe, uh, amongst the environmental groups or NGOs who's got one. Many people have got portable Geiger counters, but they are ineffective when it comes to tritium. So we're dealing with tritium either one or both hands behind our back because we can't get a handle on it. And um, so that is a real difficulty for environmental groups is trying to understand or get, a, to, get to groups with tritium, as I put it. Now, what I'd like to mention to your listeners is this, that when tritium is emitted or discharged from a nuclear power, it is rapidly transported through the environment to us, to people. And people can either breathe it in, or they can eat food which is contaminated with it, or drink contaminated water, or if the tritium lands on their skin, it's absorbed through the skin quite easily. So that means that we as human beings readily uh, are exposed to tritium, and we can quickly get large concentrations inside it. So, Ian, that really makes me wonder what that means. The NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission here in the U.S., tells everyone that tritium is not a problem, especially around Miami and Indian Point, because it's in the water and nobody's drinking that water. It's either in the bay or it's in groundwater and therefore it doesn't matter. But I've looked at a lot of the data and they're not considering breathing it in. They're not considering it on skin and they're not considering it in bioaccumulation process and ending up in the food chain. That's very true, Maggie. That it's the same in, here in Europe that nuclear regulators don't really consider tritium to be a, a big problem, but it is. Not many nuclear regulators have actually got the equipment to measure tritium. It's quite a difficult problem. Now, you very obliquely mentioned the difficulty with uh, organically bound tritium or with tritium which is um, bound up with us. And this is a big problem. You see, what happens is that when we're exposed to tritium, it builds up in our bodies, 
That means because there are many metabolic reactions, or chemical reactions, which go on in the body, the body takes up radioactive hydrogen and combines it with carbon to form organically bound tritium. Now, this is rarely taken into account in nuclear agencies, but it's important because the tritium, which is bound to carbon, stays in the body much longer than organically bound tritium is much more hazardous than tritiated water. Where you've got tritiated water, you're going to always have organically bound tritium. Can you okay. tell us more about when you intake tritium into the body in this organically bound tritium um, and it stays in the body, what does that do? What does that entail for crossing placental barriers? What does that entail for looking at internal organs, looking at the proteins you make and DNA? The main thing is that tritium is a radionuclide, right. which means that when it decays with a half-life of 12 years, so it stays around for a long time. When tritium disintegrates or decays, then what happens is it emits a beta particle. Beta particles are one of the four common kinds of radiation. Alpha particles, beta particles, x-rays, and gamma rays. When tritium disintegrates inside the body, it emits a beta particle. Beta particles have wide ranges of energy, high energy ones and low energy ones. Tritium's beta particle is a low energy one. Um, it has an energy of, on average, of 5.7 keV. Now, some people think that that means we don't have to worry about tritium. No, wrong. We do have to worry about tritium because although it has low energy, it's right next to DNA, when it, when it is next to DNA, it certainly can irradiate the DNA. In other words, it's, um, it's spot specific. And if you've got high concentration of tritium near DNA, you're in trouble. A better way of putting it, instead of saying low energy or weak, as some people put it, no, it's not. Just it's better to say it's low range. When you say yeah. low range, mm. can you sort of tell us a little bit more about what that means with low it means range? That, it means that the range of the beta particle emitted by the tritium is low. Okay. It means it doesn't travel very far. But inside the cell, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to travel right. very far. It's right there. A good comparison is that the average diameter of the DNA molecule, it's about half a micron. And that happens to coincide with the range of a, of a beta particle from tritium, which is about 0.6 microns. It's a little bit of a perfect fit. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But so in other words, uh, those people who say that tritium is a weak emitter, well, they're wrong. Um, they're, what they're doing is um, they're being misleading. Because once tritium is inside you, it doesn't matter that its range is low. It's certainly low enough for the for getting to DNA. By the way, can I also correct a misconception that many people have about when when you use the phrase radioactive water, people think, ah, it's something inside the water that's radioactive. No, it's the water itself that's radioactive. Mm. Mm-hmm. That makes a big that makes a big difference. Because you can filter out some impurity, but um, from if the water is just contaminated with, say, with cesium or strontium or whatever. But you can't, <laughs> because the water itself is, is actually radioactive, you can't filter that out. You know, Ian, the, the, the uh, nuclear industry says, well, it's just like water, and the water stays in you about 10 days or whatever, so it doesn't hang around long. And uh, you talked uh, earlier about the organically bound tritium, and how it does hang around. Uh, could you just repeat that yes. so everybody understands there's a distinction yes. here? Yes, there is. It's true, as already said, that the biological half-life of uh, tritium, or tritiated water in humans is about 10 days. But the biological half-life of organically bound tritium, that is uh, where the tritium is bound to carbon, is more like a couple of years. 
In other words, parts of it are emitted fairly quickly, within, say, 40, 50, 60 days, but part of it stays around for a long time. For humans, we think it's about, roughly speaking, two and a half to three years. So this is a real problem. What it means in practice is that the dose that you get from organically bound tritium is about five times greater than the dose you get from ordinary tributed water. I'll repeat that, five times more hazardous. So the dose is greater and also the fact that it hangs around is, is like you know having a, a landmine in your cells. Um, Believe it, yeah, yeah, you got it. The thing is, the fact that it hangs around is the reason why you get a bigger dose. That's really disconcerting. That's really so opposite to what the industry is telling mm-hmm. us. Yes, it's true. Yeah. What I'd like to know is you mentioned earlier that uh, radiation biologists know how bad tritium is. Yes. A- and how it impacts the body so negatively. Why isn't anyone acknowledging this? Why aren't our governments protecting us? Uh, what does the International Council of Radiation Protection say? I've studied tritium for a long time, and uh, what I've noticed is that that in many studies, particularly radiation biology studies, the scientists actually come right out in the conclusion and say they're worried about this. In a few of my older studies, I used to collect them, and there were about 20 or 30 quotations by famous scientists who would say, you know, we're worried about this. This is a dangerous aspect and we should do more about it. We get these expressions of concern. But on the other hand, many of the scientists who work for the nuclear industry or who work for agencies like you know, UNSCARE or ICRP or IAEA, even WHO, um, they tend to downplay the dangers of tritium. It's a serious issue, and um, it's a difficult one. It really is. Uh, there have been a number of studies, a number of reports, which have tried to highlight this. Um, there's a very famous one in 2006, I think 2007, um, by the British government. It published a report uh, called The Hazards of Tritium, and it was the report of a group called the Advisory Group on Ionizing Radiation, IAGIR. And indeed, if your listeners were to go to Google and type in hazards of tritium and then add the initials, the acronym A-G-I-R, they'll find it. And this is a long report, about 100 pages, which goes into the matter in quite a lot of detail. And it's quite clear it's saying that the hazards of tritium are greater than currently acknowledged. The problem is that this report hasn't really been acted upon by international bodies. Hmm. When I go to conferences, Maggie, I meet up with a number of my my colleagues, and they all know the children. They smile at me, and they nod their heads. They know it, but governments don't want to know it. Do you think that governments don't want to know it because so much of the military is involved with tritium, especially in the U.S. and U.K., and weapons that use depleted uranium. So there's things that impact around the world. Yes, Maggie. What what it is is that uh, tritium is a vital ingredient of nuclear weapons. It is um, what they call a trigger, and it enhances the yield of of a nuclear weapon. So tritium is always having to be used to top up nuclear weapons. Because it's got a half-life of 12 years, that means after 12 years, you have to get rid of the tritium inside the nuclear weapon and and replace it with fresh tritium. So it's a vital ingredient. The military connection is direct and acute. Indeed, as I said earlier, whenever you mention the word nuclear, tritium is involved. It's involved in nuclear fission, it's involved in nuclear weapons, and it's involved in nuclear fusion. So it's a real headache for authorities which are involved in the production of nuclear weapons or um, nuclear power companies as well.
Tritium is a bogey word for the nuclear industry. You know, Ian, uh, our friends who listen to us from Canada uh, actually have a bigger problem up there with tritium than we do down here because the uh, Canadian design, the CANDU reactors, are um, use tritium as their uh, as their moderator to reduce the, um, the the neutron speed. They routinely release a lot more tritium than than we do. Yes, that's very true, Arnie. What happens is the the heavy water reactors that you're referring to, the candy reactors, they use deuterium as both as a coolant and as a moderator because it's a very efficient uh, moderator. It means that they can use natural uranium as a fuel. And that's the reason why they do that. The problem is that it's very easy to activate deuterium up to tritium. And the end result is that the, both the moderator and the coolant in heavy water reactors are incredibly tritiated. The concentrations of tritium in the emissions and discharges are about at least a factor of 10 and up to a factor of 100 times greater per megawatt generated um, in Canadian reactors compared with American PWRs or BWRs. It's very true. There is a real problem with Canadian reactors as to, as to tritium. And Arnie mentioned CANDU reactors. I have a question about fusion reactors. We we receive a lot of emails with people asking us about fusion and thorium reactors. What kind of tritium emitters are fusion reactors? Humongous emitters. They, they use tritium as a fuel. Basically, what you're trying to do is cram together tritium and deuterium in a, a very high temperature and pressures um, so that it'll fuse and create uh, a burst of energy. Now, there's not, not, I have to say that there's most of the, of the uh, development of uh, fusion, is, it's always 30 years ahead that they're going, to be, they're going to succeed in doing it. They've not really done it. Just give apart. us 30 more years. Yeah. <laughs> it's very true. And, we we uh, comment that that is the little orphan Annie syndrome of the sun will come out tomorrow, and you know it's yeah. always a day away. Exactly. Well, in a way, thank goodness because these uh, fusion plants, if they ever got a bit ever actually started working, then the people nearby would be deluged with uh, tributed water vapor because the amounts which would be emitted daily would be just incredible. Now, let me explain to you why, uh, just very briefly. One of the difficulties, one of the uh, characteristics, I should say, with, with elemental tritium, that is hydrogen with a H3, with an O3 at the top, is that it goes through anything. It's very difficult to keep tritium isolated or keep it together in a place. For example, it's almost impossible to store hydrogen in conventional tanks. For example, if you go to a uh, hospital, you will see oxygen tanks, you will see helium tanks or propane tanks, or, but you'll never see hydrogen tanks. And the reason is simple. You put the hydrogen inside a tank and within a day it's all gone. Why? Because it oozes out through the steel, right. through the stainless steel. Because it's, why? Because it's, it's very small. Indeed, that's the reason why we don't have hydrogen cars, because of the storage problem with hydrogen. But tritium, of course, its chemical form is hydrogen. That means that if you are dealing with humongous amounts of, of tritium, it oozes out through the pipework, through the pumps, through the valves, through the flanges, through the whole system. Indeed, if you can get a system whereby if you can keep 95% throughout a whole year, you're doing extremely well. But the problem is that even if you got it up to 99%, which is all incredibly difficult, but even if you got it up to 99%, still, because of the high level, high concentrations involved, huge levels, it means you, your emissions are still very, very high. Right. This is very sobering. I'm, I'm thinking about specifically Indian Point. Indian Point is within, I believe, it's like 26 miles of downtown Manhattan. And as we've discussed, 
We have tritiated water, we have tritiated air, we have organically bound tritium. All of these factors, when you also tell me how pervasive tritium is, how difficult it is to contain, how easily it binds, it's scary. I have a lot of friends and family in New York City, and I'm thinking, you know, if you have a lot of evaporation from the Hudson, if you have a foggy day, if you have farmer's markets with organically bound, tritiated food, if it's as pervasive as you're talking about, there's a potential for a huge populace to be contaminated, and we have no clue, you know? Correct. And indeed, it's, I'm sorry to say it's worse than that, because these emissions and discharges, the annual figures that we've got, uh, certainly here in Europe, for discharge from nuclear power stations um, and emissions from nuclear power stations actually happen about well, 60% of the annual figure will occur at one particular day, one particular morning, or one particular afternoon, when because they have to open up the reactors to refuel them, take the old fuel out and put the new fuel in. And that happens on average about once a year. But... The actual emissions, or annual emissions, almost all of that happens during that one episode. Right. That's what I call it. I call that a spike. And for years and years and years, ever since the beginning of the nuclear power industry, we didn't know about that. It was we were never told that. And it was only when an, an NGO called IPPNW, which stands for International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, demanded. They got this information from a green red government, and it was a Green Party, Socialist Party government in Germany that we actually got the data. And for the very first time, we saw half hourly data from a nuclear power station called Jundremagen in southern Germany in Bavaria. And we saw for the first time these spikes. And what we did is we summed up the amounts. Um, during the spikes, and we realized that that was like 70% of the annual emissions. And then we began to realize that this had big dosimetric implications. It meant that instead of calculating the dose from an, an annual amount spread out over the year, if you actually did it where 70% came out within an afternoon, then the doses were at least 20 times higher or in some estimates, a hundred times higher. The nuclear industry likes to hide behind the average over a year, whereas uh, what they've been effectively doing is masking that spike. Yes, exactly. And the thing is that nobody knew about this. Nobody, until a couple of years ago, I think it was 2012, that we actually got the data as a result of, well, basically what happened was that the German Landa government, L-A-N-D-E government, uh, demanded when they came to power, it was a green red coalition. They demanded that from the Grundremagen power station, which the land actually partly owned, and they also demanded from the regulator, uh, which is a land regulator, they wanted the data, our half hourly emissions data throughout the whole year for their power station. And initially they refused. And they said you couldn't have it, we didn't have it. And it took him about six months to actually get the data from them. And uh, I hear through the grapevine that it was only when they threatened to re- to sack the uh, nuclear regulator that they actually got the data. So in other words, they were hiding it. They, they were really reluctant about giving the data. Very, very reluctant. And, well, and as soon when we got the data, we managed, we saw what was happening. So for the very first time, we found out, uh, by the way, Grindremigan is a, a PWR. We found out what actually was going. But the thing is that this is generic to all kinds of reactors. They have to open up the reactors to get the old fuel out and use fuel in. Some people have said, no, 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 uh, this is not correct. There is such a thing as online refueling. Well, this did actually occur a long time ago, back in the late 70s and 80s when the reactors BWRs in particular were built, but they found out that 
the online refueling never worked. Same thing, by the way, with the Candles. The online refueling never worked. And they had to close the reactor down, take the old fuel out, the new fuel out. Now, what happens is that when they are just about to do that, they depressurize the reactors. That is, they open up the valves. The hot gases under high, high pressures come gushing out. You can actually hear it with the boiling water reactors. Um, and it's that is what we should worry about because um, it contains very large amounts of the various gases. And, uh, and here's the killer punch. A major gas which is emitted is water vapor, tritiated water vapor, and also H3 hydrogen gas, which is uh, the elemental form of tritium. Now, that comes out gushing out um, under uh, high temperatures and pressures, and it forms a plume. And the plume will follow the prevailing weather patterns where the wind is blowing. And um, if it happens to be blowing south down the Hudson River, then you're right. New York City would get it. Now, I'm not trying to scare people about this. I'm just pointing out this is what happens. And it is a risk. Many people in New York getting high levels of tritium drifting downward down the Hudson Valley into, into Manhattan. By the way, there, it's not just tritium water vapor, which comes out, and also elemental hydrogen that comes out, elemental tritium, but also a variety of noble gases. And the two most important are krypton-85 and xenon-133. Krypton-85 has got a half-life of 10 years, I think, about. and xenon-133 is about 5.3 days. By the way, those two isotopes were the isotopes, and it was krypton and xenon, which were emitted at Three Mile Island um, in 1979. And at Three Mile Island, tritium must have been emitted as well. You know, the nuclear industry knew this. They just didn't tell you and other independent scientists. Mm, you got it. When I was in the industry, you know, we, we knew that uh, during outages, our releases were much higher. And, uh, you know, the rules are written such that they don't have to report it hour by hour, but they report it once a year. So you get to wash that, that peak out. One other piece of this is Maggie and I were involved on a, on a case down in Florida at St. Lucie. And we looked at 20 years worth of release data, and it didn't make sense. From year to year, it didn't make sense. Isotopes released one year were not the next year, and relative ratios were all over the place. And we concluded that uh, that nobody knew what was coming out of that plant, and that you know they were just writing down numbers, sending them to the NRC, and uh, no one at the NRC had a questioning attitude either about what those... Uh, releases really meant. So even when they report the data, um, I don't really trust the accuracy of, of what's, uh, what's going out the roof. You know, the, uh, you're right, when they depressurize that water, all of the noble gases and all of the tritium that's in solution comes, comes out as a big burp. And then you've yep. got a month of hot nuclear fuel in a fuel pool, and the fuel pool evaporates off about 5,000 gallons a day, you know, just like a, a hot pot on your on your stove will will gradually uh, evaporate out so does a fuel pool now they make up those 5000 gallons a day every day but that just goes out in the ventilation and up the stack and uh, that's tritiated water again at a peak though right at the refueling outage um, so for that month around the time the plant's being refueled that's when the pool is hottest that's when the evaporative losses from the pool are largest and that's when the tritium releases are the highest. Yes, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. I mean, yes, you're right. Of course, it must be. Well, Ian, one of the reasons we wanted to talk about this this week is also we had read a Huffington Post article, which is called Lies, Damn Lies, and Statistics, Putting Indian Point Hysteria in Perspective. And the article is written by a lobbyist called Jerry Kramer. He's chairman of the Empire Government Strategies Group. And he calls the New York Times article about Three Mile Island and Indian Point, saying that Indian Point is New York City's Three Mile Island, as damn lies about statistics. 
And he goes on to say that let's start with the claim that the plan ha- has harmed us by exposing residents to tritium. Tritium is a form of the two in H2O known as water. And he goes on and on to say it's around us in infinitesimal amounts. And then he goes into the yada yada stuff that the nuke industry always does of radiation exists naturally in the food we eat. If you like potatoes or bananas or tomatoes or other foods rich in potassium, you're ingesting an isotope called K40. And just like tritium, it emits a tiny amount of radiation. But never does he talk about that it's man-made. Never does he talk about, you know, that he's head of a group that involves energy that wants to get the plant relicensed. And he says, no one is going to drink that groundwater, of course, but having the perspective is important. Indian Point is unequivocally safe. And he just goes on and on to claim how, you know, he's got the answer to this. And it's more outright industry lie and shenanigans. Yes, I, on some of my blogs on my website, I, I pointed out that many journalists who are in the pay of, of the nuclear industry uh, write material which is, what shall I say, best it's misleading and at worst is um, outright wrong. Um, the thing is that these journalists have almost no experience and no qualification, and no education. And working with the radiation or working with radioactivity. If the newspaper editors have, in my view, they have a responsibility to try and get some things right here. And accepting material from paid journalists who are paid by the industry is wrong. They shouldn't do it. They have a responsibility to try and get it right. Uh, unfortunately, most newspaper editors have got zero knowledge about this area and they just accept um, whatever is been fed to them um, which is a real pity. One of the things that really annoys me is that these journalists the confidence with which they write is directly proportional to their ignorance. And I would say that was very true in this case except that this man masquerading as a journalist is a lawyer and founder of a trade organization and jo- lobbying organization for the industry. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's it, even, it worse. It even worse. Yeah, yeah, it makes it even worse. I I think that we're reaching a, a point to wrap this, and I want to ask Caroline and Arnie if they have any additional questions or if you have any additional points that you want to stress. Yes, one question that um, you you might have asked me is this: um, Is there a, a hazard chart for radionuclides? For example, chart which says uh, lists all the radionuclides and say how dangerous they are. So let well, me ask you that: Is there a hazard? <laughs> is there a hazard chart of radionuclides and their danger that we could share with our listeners and viewers? Effectively, no, there isn't. IAEA puts out a very basic one of four levels. But um, unfortunately, they're, they're wrong um, because they put tritium down as the low level. However, there is some scientists in Germany, what they said was that we should have a, such a chart. And if we did have a chart, then these we should have a list of the things which make the nuclide's dangerous. And what this guy did, this guy called Kirchner, what he did was that he listed 10 characteristics of a dangerous radionuclide. For example, solubility, for example, ease of transport through the air, for example, large amounts emitted, for example, uh, binding with organic tissues, etc., etc., etc. He had 10 characteristics, right? And tritium, ticked every single one of them. So by his standards, tritium was a really important radionuclide. So the, this is how I'd like to finish it with you, your, your listeners, is that those people who are truly independent scientists know that tritium is a very dangerous radionuclide and we should be far more concerned about it than 
than the nuclear industry could solve. Thank you, Ian, so much, because that confirms our concerns and what we as an organization did not have the expertise in. So thank you for talking to us all the way from the UK and and answering these questions for our listeners. And we appreciated this opportunity to have you on with us. My pleasure, Maggie. And all the very best to the crew at Fairlands, okay? Thank you very much, and we'll keep you informed. Cheers. Bye for now.